Matthew chapter 8 will be where we spend the majority of our uh, time during our lesson this evening. Matthew chapter 8. While you're turning there, I want you to think about a question. If somebody was to ask you, what is the most amazing thing that you've ever seen in your life? How would you respond to that? It's probably different for all of us. As I was growing up in small town Dibble, America, there's not much amazing to see in that town. But I do remember that the first big vacation that my family and I took whenever I was in high school was to Denver, Colorado. And I remember as we were coming up towards that line of the mountains, I was in awe. Uh, I was just amazed at what great structures were right in front of me because these Wichita mountains that we have here, they were the only mountains I'd ever seen in my life. And so you might, you might imagine that I was, you might say, a little bit awestruck as I was driving up to those beautiful snow-capped mountains. And as we drove up on, on Pikes Peak and we got to the very top, and my mother the entire way hyperventilating, and we get to the very top and we go and they say, now don't walk all the way to the edge. So of course, that's exactly what I wanted to do. And I walk all the way to the edge and I look and I see that I'm above some clouds. I was in awe. What's the most amazing thing you've ever seen? We as, as humans, for one reason or another, we love to be amazed. We love to see things that just uh, to, that shake us a little bit. Uh, the most popular segment, for those of you that are sports fans, uh, on SportsCenter and has been for years, is the top ten. It's always the top ten plays of the day or of the week as you get to see the most amazing highlights. We love to be amazed. But I want us to think for just a minute about what it would take to amaze Jesus. What would it take to amaze the perfect Son of God, the only one that is ever perfect, the only one that was without sin, what would it take to amaze him? You can search throughout all of Scripture and you'll never find an account of Jesus being amazed with anyone's athletic ability. You won't find an account of Jesus being amazed with how beautiful a building is that someone was able to construct. But we do find a couple of instances that the Bible tells us that Jesus was amazed, that he marveled, that he was in awe. One of those is found in Mark chapter 6 and verse 6, and it wasn't a good amazement. Jesus, as he was passing through his hometown of Nazareth, and he was despised and he was rejected. Mark 6 and verse 6 tells us that he marveled, that he was amazed because of their unbelief. Jesus was amazed about how much these people did not believe in him. But then we find one positive example of Jesus being amazed, and that's in Matthew chapter 8. Our reading tonight will be from Matthew chapter 8, beginning in verse 5. It says, When he entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, and he's suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. This text tells us that Jesus marveled, that he was in awe, because of the faith of this man, this centurion man who not only was just a random happenstance that he came to, to meet this man, but he was also a Gentile. And we find that Jesus was amazed by this man's faith. This evening, I want us to spend just a few minutes looking at what was so amazing about the centurion. What it was that took Jesus back and made him marvel and tell his disciples, tell those that had been following him, I've not found anybody with this much faith. What was so special about him? And more importantly, how can you and I apply those things to our life? Hopefully you have an outline for the lesson this evening. If you do, number one on the outline, for those of you who like to take notes, is that the centurion, he was, he was tender-hearted. The centurion was tender-hearted. In Matthew chapter 8 and verse 6, we find the centurion speaking to our Savior, and he says, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home and suffering 
terribly. The interesting thing, and you'll see the note on your outline, is that the Greek word that the centurion used for servant could be translated either child or slave. Whenever Luke records this account, Luke chapter 7 and verse 2, Luke refers to this man as a slave, as a servant. But we see coming from the centurion's mouth, what did, how did he describe this individual? He referred to him with a word that could either be a servant or a child. We see that he was tender-hearted. He didn't just view this, this servant as someone who is disposable, but someone that could even be his own child. The fact that the centurion cared enough about the slave to act as though he was, he was his own child gives us, a, gives us a glimpse of how tender-hearted he was. I want us to put this text in its context and its perspective. We begin looking at Matthew chapter 5 through Matthew 7, and we see that great sermon on the mount that Jesus preached. We see the, the sermon that he begins to preach as uh, Matthew chapter 5, at the beginning of that passage it says that he went up on the mountain and he sat down and he began to open his mouth and teach. And he began with the Beatitudes and so on and so forth. And we see the amazing wisdom flowing from the mouth of our Savior. Following that great sermon, we find so many people that seem to just be flocking to Jesus, asking for him to perform miracles, asking for healing. You might be able to uh, surmise that in this, in this context, in this period of time, when so many people were trying to come to Jesus, this centurion who obviously had heard about Jesus, had heard of his reputation, heard of the things he was doing, probably knew about all of the people that were trying to get their, their few minutes with Christ. It would have been easy for him to just reason amongst himself that Jesus is going to be so busy. He's not even going to have time to deal with my servant, why even bother taking the time? Not only did he bother taking the time, but it, the text tells us that he was deeply troubled because of the suffering of the servant. The text also tells us that Jesus marveled at the centurion's faith. But what I want us to do this evening is ask, how do we compare with this, with this man? Obviously, we know from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1 that our ultimate goal, our ultimate person that we are to imitate is Jesus Christ, no one else. We understand that. But I think it's also important for us to look at those people that Jesus commended and say, what was so special about them? And also, how do I compare to them? We see how tender-hearted he was. How about you? How about me? Do we share that same type of level of compassion that this centurion had? Do we show the compassion on those that, that need our help? Do we go out of our way to try to help them? Do we strive to connect them to Jesus because we know that he is the only one that can truly heal their wounds. Number two on your outline, on what was so special about the centurion was simply that he was humble. He was humble. In Matthew chapter 8 and verse 9, we find the centurion speaking, and he says, For I too am a man under authority, with soldiers under me, and I say to one, Go, and he goes, and to another, Come, and he comes. And to my servant, Do this, and he does it. We understand that the centurion was not just a soldier, that he was also someone that had a lot of power and authority. We're, we're familiar with the great uh, Roman Empire. And we know that this, this Roman centurion, each one, each centurion, they were often referred to as the backbone of the entire Roman army. That without these great men, their, their armies would just fall apart. See, this wasn't just a, a normal commander. This, this centurion, he would fight alongside his men gaining tremendous amounts of respect from everybody, not just because of his wisdom and his, and his direction, but also his willingness to do those very same things himself. And we find this man that he was a centurion, and he also directed, he commanded a hundred soldiers that were underneath him. Very powerful man. Very powerful man that had the respect of so many. I'm afraid that many times whenever we come across people today that are very powerful, they're not always very humble. They're not always very humble in the same way that this man was. In the same way that this man was to the point that he would look at a servant and refer to him even as a child. Oftentimes, whenever we see those people, maybe they become prideful and arrogant and they want nothing to do with servants. But this man was different. Going out of his way to do everything he could to connect his servant to Jesus. In verse 7, Jesus offers to come and to heal this man's servant Matthew 8 and verse 8. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. 
but only say the word and my servant will be healed. The centurion's response was, I am not worthy. Here's this great, powerful man. Has the respect of all those around, but he says, I am not worthy. There's two things that we can understand from this. One was he recognized that Jesus was so much superior to him, was so far ahead of him. And that he was not worthy to have him come under his roof, as he says. But also, picture this in mind. As the many were flocking to Jesus, looking for miracles, looking for signs. If he would have allowed Christ to come into his home, he also would be taking Christ away from the crowd. Not only did he view himself as someone that was unworthy to host Christ within his own home, but he also didn't view himself more important than anyone else and anyone else's needs. Jesus was in awe with this man. How do we measure up to his humility? How do you and I measure up to this level of humility? Someone that has great power, but honestly believes that they are no better than anyone else. Do we sometimes feel as though we're more important than others? Do we place our needs in front of the needs of others? Do we spend our time and energies trying to better the life of ourselves or maybe the lives of someone else? Thirdly and finally tonight, I want us to look at the ultimate reason why Jesus was in awe of this man. It's because he had unwavering confidence in the power of Jesus. He had unwavering confidence in the power of Jesus. We've seen that he was a great man of power. We see that he was a man who had a tender heart. He was a man that was humble. Also, he was a man that had supreme confidence in Jesus Christ. In Matthew 8 and verse 8, it says, The centurion replied, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. Notice the centurion's quest. He, he believed that Jesus could simply speak, that he could simply utter a word and heal someone who was some distance away. He didn't believe that Jesus had to reach out and physically touch his servant. He didn't believe that Jesus had to be in the same building or the same vicinity of a servant, that he could just say the word and it would be done. Matthew 8 and verse 10, when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. Throughout the ministry of Christ, we see time and time again people coming to Jesus for healing. We see people coming to Jesus because they wanted to see something. They wanted to see a show. They wanted to see a miracle performed because they had heard of all the wonderful things that Christ had done. And they came hoping maybe to be entertained, to be amazed. A centurion was not like this. He wasn't interested in a show. He wasn't interested in anything flashy. He wasn't interested in that one memorable moment. Hey, guess what I watched Jesus do today? He wasn't interested in that. This man was simply interested in the health of a servant, and he knew that Jesus could help. So he went to him. The centurion had supreme confidence in Christ. I want to ask us this question tonight. How do we measure up with our confidence that we have in Jesus? Do we ever try to put limits on the power of Christ? within our own lives? Do we ever spend time uh, looking at someone else's life and saying, well, that person's life will take too much work for Jesus? Maybe that person will, will not have, uh, they won't be good enough for Christ. Christ can't really cleanse that individual. Maybe we spend a little bit of time looking at negative trends that are going on in our world today and saying that all hope is lost and we forget that Jesus is still on the throne. Amen, church? We look around at so many negative things. Maybe we see problems within our governments and we believe that Jesus can't help us today. Maybe we believe that we need to sell people Christianity. And what I mean by that is tr trying to better the church as if you or I have that ability. As we're talking to someone and trying to bring them to Christ because, man, we have so many wonderful activities Man, we have so many great friendships. You can be involved in this group and this group and this group when the power is not in any of that. Power is in Jesus. Amen, church? I wonder how often, maybe intentionally or unintentionally, we lack the unlimited supreme confidence in Jesus that this centurion had. One of the saddest stories, one of the saddest conversations I've ever had with any individual was over breakfast in a cafe having a Bible study with this man, and he begins telling me that he understood everything I was teaching him, and that he understood what he needed to do to become a Christian. But he said, I can't do that. I've been too bad of a man, and Jesus would never want me. And I'm afraid too many times we begin to believe that very same way. 
we begin to limit Jesus. Rather than having that supreme confidence that we know that the centurion did, he had a tender heart, he was humble, and he had supreme confidence in Jesus. What about us tonight? Maybe there's one of us that are here this evening that as we begin to look upon our life, we see that this man, that as Jesus was going throughout his ministry, and he had the opportunity to meet so many people, to influence so many lives. But yet we see this one man that stands out as Jesus comes into contact with him, and he marveled. He was amazed by what he just encountered. How does our faith in Christ measure up to this man? If you're here this evening and you realize that maybe your faith in Christ isn't what it needs to be and you'd like the prayers of the church, we'd offer that invitation for you this evening. If there's someone here this evening that you realize that you've never put your supreme confidence in Christ because you've never given him your life to begin with, there's no better time than right now, no better time than tonight to put Christ on a baptism and have your sins washed away. If we can help you in any spiritual way tonight, we'd invite you to come as together we stand and we sing the song of invitation.